let's now go on to our second speaker, so Professor Benjamin Vandelt, who is um, a professor at the Institute of Astrophysics at the Sorbonne University, also CNRS um, Institute uh, in Paris, France. He also has an affiliation in uh, at the Center for Computational Astrophysics in Flotteron uh, Institute in New York. And he's worked on on, um, on the European Space Agency's recent Planck mission, which maybe he'll talk about as well. Um, uh, in 2018, he won the Gruber Prize in, in cosmology. And also he's the creator of something called Cosmology at Home, which is a very important tool that really connects um, how people can do data analysis, can take part in, in, in science. But um, Professor Vandelt, so I just want to let you start. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackson. Hi, everyone. Um, very, very happy to be here um, and get a chance to explain something to you and have a chat with you. Um, so, I uh, one of my um, one of the things I work on uh, in my research is on applications of artificial intelligence to and computational methods and statistical methods and machine learning to cosmological data. I won't talk about that today. Um, but if you want to uh, keep up to date uh, with mes messages about that and about cosmology and physics in general, uh, you can follow me on uh, Twitter or formerly called Twitter, now X, uh, at this at this link. All right, so let's go deeper. Um, Elsa has given you a fantastic overview of the recipe for the universe. Um, let's go and see if we can understand some of the most mysterious aspects of it. All right, so what are we trying to understand? Just Let's just uh, take stock for a second. Well, we're cosmologists. Uh, cosmologists are not known for their um, intellectual modesty. So let's just ask some, uh, some big questions. We want to know how the universe began, how structure appeared in the universe. So structure meaning why, is, why are there more galaxies in one region than in another? Um, how did galaxies appear? How did stars appear? How did planets appear? How did people appear? That's really, you know, the little questions that we ask. And um, how did the universe evolve from its very beginning until today? Uh, and then very closely connected to that, which you already heard a little bit in Elsa's talk, um, which is what the universe is made of. And those two things are closely connected through Einstein's equation. Um, you know, this G equals T with the funny index indices, uh, that's the equation that's going to help us there. We'll get back to that. All right. So along the way, I'm going to try to help you actually teach you a superpower, a physics superpower. Um, and physicists are, are a little bit unique in the way they think. Um, they often use what's called toy models. Now, it may seem kind of a little bit ridiculous. OK, we're supposed to be serious physicists, um, but toy models are a powerful tool. Uh, in the intellectual arsenal of top research physicists. In fact, I'll have a picture of Einstein a little bit later uh, in front of a blackboard thinking about a toy model. Um, here's how it works. Here's how physicists often approach a super complicated, difficult problem. You take that complicated problem and you break it down and make it as simple as you possibly can to create a simple mental picture that retains only the difficult aspect of it, but gets rid of everything else to make a toy model. And then you uh, really analyze that very carefully. Okay, this is how you often come to, you can come to some amazing conclusions and I'll, um, I hope that you can, uh, you can find it. Sometimes maybe you've heard of the joke about physicists and spherical cows, um, you know, Physicist is asked, so what's the volume of a cow? And you and the physicist goes, like, how big is your cow? Well, it's about you know two meters long. Okay, so let's just take a sphere with the diameter of two meters, and then you figure out what the volume of the cow is. Um, so that's one way to uh, simplify things to get approximate answers. But we'll try we'll uh, try, do that to get insight in the concepts, conceptual insights through um, this this tool of using toy models. Okay, so let's get started with some of these uh, questions. How did the universe begin? Well, how do we find out? How would you find out how something happened in the past? Well, it's easy, just time travel to the past and look at it, right? That, if you can do that, that's the best way you can do it. 
Well, but time travel, you know, it's a little bit hard and uh, and it's dangerous. Imagine that we time travel into the past. Suddenly we're in free space. You you know, you have to, it gets, in the early universe is not a nice place. So um, not for humans anyway. So um, let's, let's see if we can, what we can do. Well, luckily, physics gives us a perfectly safe way to observe the past, to observe the past. Okay, we can't time travel there. At least we don't know how. But we can we can look into the past. In fact, you can't even help looking into the past. You always look into the past. How, how and let's see how that works. Well, so imagine that you're in the center here, and the whole universe is around you. You know, shown in this uh, in this reddish blob, and the little squiggly lines are uh, light waves that reach you from the distant universe, or even from something nearby, like. Uh, the blackboard in, or whiteboard in front of your classroom uh, or the, the, the light from the screen, okay? You see your screen about a nanosecond in the past. So that's very young light. If you look into uh, the deep universe, you see older light, light that has traveled longer and so therefore reaches you from, from farther away, okay? And you can't help this. This is just a fact of the speed of light being not infinitely fast. Okay, so... Uh, if I were standing in front of you, you'd see me a few tens of nanoseconds ago. If you look up at the moon, you see it a second ago. The sun, you see about eight minutes ago. Uh, so you're always kind of time traveling to the past in terms of your observations. Stars in the night sky, um, you can see up to like, thousands or tens of thousands of years ago. This is stars in our Milky Way. If you see other galaxies with telescopes, you see the millions to billions of years ago. Okay, so we have a wonderful way in cosmology. It's one of the deep reasons why we can do cosmology, because we can look into the past. We can see what happened uh, in the past. And so what's the oldest light we can see if you want to look all the way to the beginning? Well, it turns out this is something called the cosmic microwave background. And really what it is, is the light that is the afterglow of the Big Bang. It's the light that comes off of the hot plasma that filled the universe in the early um, the early moments, and if we and it turns out to be super uniform uniform everywhere. It looks the same everywhere. It's just an overall glow on the sky, and this Planck mission that uh, Jackson mentioned I was involved in um, actually made extremely detailed measurements of this uniform glow and cranked up the contrast massively, factor of a hundred thousand. And then if you can look at that high contrast image, you start seeing these patterns uh, that I'm showing you here. That's the real map, by the way. Um, and, and you see these very small fluctuations in the afterglow of the Big Bang. Okay, so we, we can see the beginning of the universe. All right, so how did structure then appear in the universe? So we answered the first thing. We, get, we can see the beginning. Let's go, let's keep going. How did structure appear? Well, so we actually... Just using the same trick, we can use we can see structure appearing across time. Okay, just by looking at more and more recent light, we th see things that are closer to us. So we start at the um, this oldest light, the cosmic microwave background, and then let's zoom in on a patch of it, and let's zoom in on a small patch of that, just to give you a sense of scale. Then we get the size of some of the largest galaxy surveys, the deepest galaxy surveys that we have um, available to us. And while the structure in this early universe is very, very, very faint, like I told you, it's super contrast enhanced in what I've shown you here. So there's only one part in a hundred thousand. This is, you know, if you if you if you move your hand over your desk where you're sitting, you feel some slight ripples in the desk. Those are much bigger than the small fluctuations that I'm showing you here. But then later, these galaxies clump together, and suddenly there's like big clumps and empty bits in between that we call voids. And if you keep zooming in, zooming in, and get closer and closer to us in time and in space, eventually we get to the Milky Way. Here's here's us. This is our, our galaxy. Um, so this gives you a sense of how, we, um, how big the universe is, and we see structure forming. Okay, great. So we, we've seen the beginning of the universe. We can see structure forming. And um, Elsa already hinted 
how important the expansion is of the universe. So let's think about the universe expanding. And some of your video questions also asked about this. So let's do this. So now we're going to get to our first toy model. Okay, here, this is not the toy model yet. This, what I'm showing you here, is an actual picture taken by the James Webb Space Telescope, the, the JWST. That's a deep universe picture. And you can see lots and lots and lots of galaxies here. This is just one patch of sky. Okay. And what you notice is that the galaxies are more or less uniformly distributed. Okay. There's not a huge clump of galaxies here on one side and no galaxies on the other side. So it's more or less uniformly distributed. So this is what we call homogeneity, meaning that more or less on average, the universe looks the same on one end of the picture as on the other end of the picture. And in fact, in any picture that you could take in any direction in the sky. Okay, so now what is, how do we build a toy model out of this? Uh, what else is uniform that's very easy to describe? Well, a uniform grid, like a checkerboard or a chessboard. Okay, so let's take those galaxies, put them on a uniform grid, okay, so we can start thinking about it uh, more easily. And in fact, it's too complicated still. Let's make it even simpler because we want to just have something uniform. We don't really care about the details of the galaxies and so forth. Let's make it simpler. So, okay, so we're just going to take one line in the grid. Okay, we're going to just take a one-dimensional um, version of this. Not 3D, not 2D, 1D. Okay, simpler. All right, so let's now take this one-dimensional line and we'll move it across. And let's make it even simpler, because you remember these are galaxies. I just want to think about the line expanding, okay? So I'm going to turn this into a line with dots on it, okay? Here's my toy model of the universe. It's a one-dimensional universe, and I have uniformly spaced galaxies in it. And that retains everything that I really care about. It's the homogeneity and the fact that the universe uh, is, is, you know, is this looks kind of the same everywhere. That's homogeneity. And let's expand this now. Let's see what happens, okay? Now we can easily think about that because we can uh, we can plot we can make pictures of this as it expands. So let's say we focus on this galaxy here. Okay, this galaxy stays where it is. This galaxy expands away. This galaxy expands away. So if I expand this here by a factor of two, see now the galaxies are uh, twice as far away from each other. If I look from the point of view of this galaxy here, I see this one over there moving to the side. I see the next one moving actually farther, you see, this one only moved this far, this one moved twice as far, this one moved three times as far. So um, in an expanding universe, you see galaxies that are farther away from you move more quickly, okay? And this is the Hubble law that Elsa mentioned. Okay, and this is if the universe is homogeneous and expands the same everywhere. All right, let's expand it one more time. Okay, so here we have... Uh, a universe that's even that's half the density after another uh, bit big of you know another step of expansion, and you see again the galaxies move away and they um and they still like the farther away they are the faster they expand like this one now first you know is now farther away and so forth okay so we see distant galaxies moving away from us in an expanding universe this is what we understand from this toy model in fact we also understand that galaxies that are farther away move faster away. So it's twice as far away, it moves twice as fast. Three times as far away, moves three times as fast, and so forth. Okay? All right, so now you understand uh, the expanding universe. But in fact, there's nothing special about the left end of this. I just said that that one was us. I could have said the one on the right is us. In fact, let's think about another civilization living on a galaxy on the other end of this diagram. Okay, so uh, here... So I could just draw exactly the same picture, and to them it's the same. To them, they, they see exactly the same. They see distant galaxies moving away from them. They see the galaxies that are twice as far move twice as fast, three times as far, three times as fast. Okay, so they see the same thing. In fact, I could have started anywhere. Okay, I could have started in the middle, and that in the middle um, is, you know, the galaxy stays there, these galaxies move away. So in a homogeneous universe, all galaxies see the all the other galaxies moving away from them, with distant galaxies moving away faster. This is just a consequence of a universe that expands homogeneously. Some of your questions that you sent online were about, so if, it, if the universe expands, what does it expand into? 
Well, think about this line here. The line expands into itself. You have an infinitely long line. It expands. The dots move farther apart, but it doesn't really have to expand into anything. So this is also a great toy model for understanding that, that you don't have to have the universe expand into something else. It can just expand. It can just stretch, just like a line that you keep stretching. All right, great. So toy models work. Um, okay, so let's use this toy model. And in fact, we can use this uh, insight that by, just like Elsa said, if we can measure galaxies um, that are far away from us, we can, if you, or if we measure the speeds of galaxies, galaxies that move away faster from us must be farther away if the universe is homogeneously expanding. And so we have a way of finding the distance to distant galaxies. All we have to do is measure their speeds. It turns out measuring their speeds is super easy. Um, it's actually, you know, it just it turns out every galaxy kind of has a has a particular kind of color, and so it gets redder if it moves away from us. This is kind of like the Doppler effect. It's like um, light getting stretched because of the expansion speed, or like just like when you have a an ambulance going by, it goes da 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 da, and then as it comes as it goes past you, it goes da 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 da. Okay, so you can hear the speed of the ambulance. And it's the same thing with light, not just not sound, it's light, that you can see the speed of a galaxy. Okay, so you know if it's far away, it has to move fast. So if it moves fast, it's got to be far away. So we can map the universe in 3D. And here's what you get. This is a particular galaxy survey. This is a slice of it. The red dots are actual galaxies that we know how fast away they move. And we've can, we can make a map out of that. And then the, the blue, purple, white stuff here is a reconstruction of all the dark matter uh, that we made um, that the galaxies populate. Okay, so we can, now we figure it out what expansion means of a homogeneous universe, how to use it to make 3D maps of our universe with observations. Great. Okay, let's keep going. We can actually get another, yet another insight from this toy model, just some lines with dots on them. It's amazing. All right, so. Every galaxy sees the other galaxies around it expand away from it. Every single one. Everybody sees the other galaxies go away. Remember, on the left, in the middle, on the right. So every galaxy in this model, in this in this expanding universe, thinks that they're in the center. Okay, To us, it looks like everything moves away from us. We th think we're in the center, but all the other ones see the same, remember? So... Actually, the center is everywhere in this universe. Everybody thinks they're in the center. And so everywhere is the center. In fact, the universe, an expanding homogeneous universe, all points are equivalent. So you could say there's no center because every, everywhere is the center. Those two things are kind of the same. But every, okay, so um, that's also super important to understand for you because if you think about an expanding universe, most people will always think like an explosion away from one point. But in fact, uh, it's a kind of expansion that goes away from every point and everyone is feels like they're in the center of it. And if you draw these lines on a piece of paper and you think about it, you'll come to the same conclusion. All right. So the universe is expanding. We got that. How did it start? That's the big question. And Elsa already told you the universe got a kick in the beginning. There's some leftover energy from the Big Bang that's that, that gave it a kick in the beginning. So something banged at the Big Bang. So let's say if you can understand that. So how would you expect the expansion to go if the universe just got kicked in the beginning? Remember, we know the universe has ordinary and dark matter that uh, Elsa mentioned to you, and that gravitates. All right, so let's try and do a toy model to try to understand this. And for this toy model, can you see me? I'm going to use this little ball, okay? So let's do a toy model. Think about a gravitating situation where something got a kick in the beginning. All right, so how would you expect a gravitating system to behave that just got, a, got kicked in the beginning? Okay, so, um, well, if I kick this in the beginning, give it a little kick. Okay, it does this. It flies up and comes back. I could kick it a bit more. Okay, it goes out of frame, but it does come back. If I kick it a bit more, okay, uh, if I threw it really hard, maybe it would actually fly off the earth and keep going. Okay, um, 
I'd have to be really good at throwing. I'm not that good. But, you know, imagine that I could. I mean, it would be possible. So we have a gravitating system, a kick in the beginning. So either it goes up, comes back down, or if I kick it really hard, it keeps going. Um, but those are kind of the options. All right. So given that experiment here, how would you expect a gravitating system to behave that just got a kick in the beginning? I've got a few lines here. Okay, this is to the right is in time. Okay, so for example, my little ball going up and down, it's kind of like this. Okay, it goes up and down. That's kind of the version one. And then there are a couple of lines here that uh, that where I throw it really hard in the beginning and it just keeps going. Okay, and then there's a third weird line where if I throw it up and, and it kind of slows down a little bit and then suddenly it goes, vroom, it, just, it just accelerates and disappears. Okay, those three different possibilities. All right, so which of those three um, do you think is uh, is what's going to happen? Well, we've done the experiment. Uh, something kicked in the beginning. Which one do you think? Write down the answer. Or maybe write it in the chat. One, two, or three. Which one makes sense to you? All right. Let's see. What are people writing? Uh, three. Three. One, two, or three. Okay. No, no, but really think about just the example I gave with the little ball, okay? Uh, I don't know about your, I don't know about um, wherever you are, but if I throw this ball, it does tend to come back down. <laughs> so, you know, um, or if I throw it really hard, maybe it flies off quite a while. Um, and the rock, a rocket that gets a big kick in the beginning might leave the earth, but it's not going to then suddenly zoom off when it after it switched its engines off. Okay, lots of people give ones. All right, fine. That's I agree. That's totally the expectation. You would expect it to just go up and come back down, or maybe to leave, but not nothing else. All right, let's see. So if, actually, I kind of cheated a little bit. This is not a picture of a ball going up and down. Uh, the lines here, the lines correspond to past different ways the universe can expand. Okay, and this is in billions of years. This is now right here, and it turns out. Our universe, when we go out and measure it, we expect it to either expand and then crunch back together, or we expect it to expand and maybe keep going and just keep slowing down. But our actual universe, and Elsa mentioned this, actually is expanding, okay? And not just expanding, it's accelerating the expansion. So here we're here, and we can measure this curve of this line showing that it's going curving up and getting faster and faster. So this is crazy. This is totally nuts. Okay, I just want to impress upon you how insane this is. All right, the fact that it's because it's a gravitating system, it got a kick in the beginning. It you see, I mean, even it it got a kick in the beginning. Here's the red line that corresponds to our universe. It got a kick in the beginning. It slowed down for a bit, and just when you thought it was just going to sort of coast along, no. And it just suddenly decides to go, whoop, like it just keeps, it just accelerates. And this is, in, and so this line corresponds to the universe with dark energy, 70%, 0.7 of that universe is dark energy and only 0.3. So most of it is in dark energy. And so we discovered suddenly, uh, this is Perlmutter and Rees, um, Nobel, Nobel Prize, discovered that our universe is accelerating. And that's a huge, huge question because it just makes no sense whatsoever. Okay. So in spite of all the mass in the universe, that, that kind of played the role, the role of all the mass in the universe was played by the earth in this in this example with the ball, right? Uh, because that's gravitating, that's making the ball turn around or slows it down. But in spite of all that mass in the universe, in fact, there's something else that that causes an acceleration. So what is happening? So let's let's take a deep dive here and understand what's causing this acceleration of the universe. And of course, what are we going to do? It's hard, conceptually difficult. We'll do a toy model. All right. And I brought another prop here. Can you see me? This is this is a rubber band. All right. So just like before, actually, it's a bit like before, except I made it a rubber band, so it's actually closed around, but it's also just a one-dimensional model of our universe, okay? We got rid of the 3D, the 2D, just 1D, okay? Just, a, just it's closed in a loop. All right, so let's think of a piece of expanding universe. Here it is, okay? I can expand it. All right, good. 
just like before. So ex an expanding universe like this, what you, just like a rubber band, you would expect it to become thinner as it expands. Okay, so here's the here's the rubber band. Let me expand it. So in an expanding universe without dark energy, a normal kind of universe, okay, that would slow down or turn around the expansion, gets less down, less dense as it expands. You see that? Okay, so it's dense, like just like a rubber band. And as you, it gets less dense. The band gets thinner as I stretch it. All right, good. But the crazy thing is when you uh, in a in the universe with dark energy, mo where most of it is dark energy, like ours, the density stays the same. So when I, in that sort of a universe, when I stretch, in fact, it doesn't thin out, it stays the same density. So that is, you know, mind blown point two now. Okay, why is, why, why how is that possible? How can you make something bigger and get more of it without it stretching up? How is that possible? Okay, let's think about, uh, actually, now we'll do some equations. Don't worry. It's, not gonna, it's almost not going to hurt. Okay, <laughs> so um, mass has energy. Okay, you all know this. E equals mc squared. It's on all the t-shirts. Okay, so you know, you know it's true. All right, so mass is energy. So E is mc squared, or m is E divided by c squared. Okay, so here the mass is, I'm thinking about the mass density of the strip. So if I put enough energy into this as I expand it, I can I can put mass into it and make it um, thicker, okay? So maybe what's happening is that somehow there's energy that's being put into this as, as it expands um, that's replenishing the energy and uh, the mass and making it unif making it the same density as before. But where is that coming from? Okay, next point. Where is this coming from? All right, it gets even stranger, all right? But stay with me. So normally, the expansion of the universe would slow down. We figured this out because of gravity. Just like, you know, if I if I gave this rubber band a kick, it would maybe go out a little bit, but then slow down and turn around. But with dark energy, the expansion of the universe speeds up. We've seen that. It accelerates. So energy is mass. Mass gravitates, you know this. So is dark energy something to do with anti-gravity? Okay, it almost seemed like it because the dark energy is accelerating the expansion. So it's like as if gravity suddenly stops working or works in the opposite sense. All right, so here's the important bit. The equation that Elsa taught you about, this Einstein's field equation that tells you how the space and space-time of the universe responds to the energy in it on the right-hand side. If you look at it carefully, it turns out it implies that the thing that gravitates is not just the mass, but actually also pressure, because pressure is energy, and it turns out um, energy, you know, energy, as you know, is kind of like mass, and so both of those things together actually have a gravitational effect. Okay, by the way, here's Einstein thinking about a toy problem in the background. You can see clearly a very simple toy problem. Um, Okay, so for example, in the center of the sun, super high pressure, the entire sun pushing down on the, on the middle. Um, the center of the sun has more gravity than just the mass because of all that energy uh, due to the pressure. So in fact, you need this to understand the center of the sun. Okay, so even relatively nearby in our universe, this makes a difference. It's not just the mass, it's mass plus three times the pressure. Okay, but now I've kind of told you that there's even more mass, even more gravity, so it seems even crazier that the universe expands, accelerates its expansion. It should be slowed down more by this gravity. Okay, what's going on? Okay, so let's think about another concept. Let's think about tension. Tension, like in this rubber band, is negative pressure, if you think about it. Like the tension, pressure wants to push, push things out. Tension is the opposite. It pulls things in. Wow, so now we have negative pressure. What does that do? Well, if gravity acts on mass plus three times the pressure, but if tension is negative pressure, I can just substitute here, okay? So gravity acts on mass minus three times the tension, minus. Oh, wow. So now if I have tension, I can make the thing that gravitates less. Okay, great. So actually, it turns out just, you know, 
here, if I have tension in my rubber band, if you had a super sensitive uh, apparatus, measure the gravitational attraction of this rubber band, of the rubber band that you hold in your hands, okay, that I hold in my hand, that rubber band, when I pull on it, actually it has slightly less gravity because of the tension. Very, very slightly. It's, it's tiny. Turns out there's a factor of C squared, the speed of light squared, that make, that divides this. So it's very small. It's tiny. It's very difficult to measure with the rubber band. But if you have really, 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 really strong tension, you can make gravity less. Okay. So you can make that thing not just less, but if you make the tension large enough, there's a factor three, so you can make it negative. You can make gravity negative. Okay, let that sink in. And if you make gravity negative, the universe is going to fly apart because now suddenly gravity becomes repulsive. Okay, gravity that you think of always as attractive when you have tension and you have strong enough tension, like in this rubber band, but a super strong rubber band that you pull on, gravity can become repulsive. So dark energy actually is dark tension. It would be a much better name. If I had named it, I would have named it dark tension. It makes mass minus three times tension negative because the tension is so super large that when you pull on it, that uh, when, you know, the overall gravity actually makes it fly apart. Gravity becomes repulsive. Einstein's gravity becomes repulsive. So it's not anti-gravity. It is gravity, but gravity is repulsive when the tension is large. So the universe repels itself when it's filled with this dark tension, the dark energy. So this repulsion, actually, if you think about your physics classes, and if you uh, work against a force, uh, you do energy. So you working gravity re does is repulsion. It works against this tension as it expands the rubber band. So it's putting in. It has to do work against it, but gravity is repulsive, doing work against the tension, and that work is energy, which is exactly the energy that's going into the density and replenishing it and filling it back up. So the universe expands, repulsed, ever faster because the tension uh, keeps increase i mean it's key, it's still it's always there and the density remains constant because the work gravity does against the tension fills back the energy so it creates mass through e equals mc squared m is equal to e over c squared and replenishes the energy when the universe expands okay so now we're at the end the dark en dark energy or dark tension creates creates gravitational repulsion accelerated expansion, and constant density, even when the universe, as the universe is stretched. All right, so now the finale. We observe repulsive gravity in the universe right now. This is not, you know, Ben Van Delt having flights of fantasy. It's a Nobel Prize winning discovery uh, that the universe is accelerating the expansion. And if it has anything to do with dark energy, like I just explained, or dark tension, as I like to call it, uh, then we're looking at the universe accelerating, means we're looking at the, the action, the effect of repulsive gravity. And repulsive gravity in the very beginning of the universe leads to something called inflation. This is something that Elsa mentioned. So not, we see accelerated expansion right now, repulsive gravity right now. And one way to explain the beginning of the universe is called inflation, which, by the way, is also accelerated expansion, driven by dark tension. And Elsa told you that something kicked the expansion in the beginning, and it turns out it's exactly the effect from that repulsive gravity, the after effect of that repulsive gravity. So now you understand how the expansion can accelerate and what banged at the Big Bang. It's not bad for 25 minutes. All right, let's ask some questions. So thank you very much, Professor Vanden. Uh, very interesting talk. And also thank you again, Dr. Takshira. So we've had two very nice, interesting talks in this in, in this in this last hour. So thank you very much also to the students who submitted many questions. So we, we received a lot of video submissions, a lot of questions. And I think most of them actually were answered um, in, in these two talks. I'll just play um one of the questions that, that maybe we can kick off the, the Q&A session with. Hi, 
Hi. Yes. I'm Gav. I'm Nera. I'm Kibra. And we're from Edirne College, Turkey. And our questions are, what was day before Big Bang? Do parallel universes exist? How do astronomers measure the distance to distant galaxies? What do you think about the theory that space is expanding every day? Is there a possibility of finding life on other planets? How does the absence of gravity feel? Thanks. Thanks. We appreciate for the opportunity of letting us ask our questions. So uh, I don't know who would like to tackle this question. Well, there are a lot of questions. Yes. <laughs> yeah. let's, pick, let's pick one. I can comment on a question I really like, which is the question of what was there before the Big Bang? Because <laughs> I think it's the most natural thing to to think about, right? Because if we say there is an initial moment, what was there before? But the, the weird thing, I think it's really weird to think about these things, is there is no before the Big Bang, right? Because the Big Bang, as we think of it, uh, is the beginning of time and the beginning uh, of space. So it, create, it was created, space and time were created. <laughs> they didn't exist. So if they didn't exist, there's no before because there was no time uh, when there was no, there was no Big Bang. But it's, <laughs> it's a okay. difficult, it's a difficult thing to, to grasp, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, there are a lot of ideas about what could be before the Big Bang. Sometimes the Big Bang, you know, sometimes we yeah we call it like the the singularity in the beginning, the beginning of time. But a lot of times when we say Big Bang, what we really mean is that hot period in the early universe when the when the universe uh, was filled with radiation, and uh, and then the answer there is an answer which is uh, that uh, something else. Um, like inflation that uh, that um, Elsa mentioned um, was before that, where the universe was, you know, it made the universe big and smooth and long lived, um, and just kind of prepared it to to become homo like a homogeneous, isotropically expanding universe that we observe today. There are different versions of that, and there is active research trying to see whether maybe. Uh, the universe could have bounced in the beginning. There's, uh, but these are speculative ideas. Um, so maybe the universe at some point uh, did collapse and then bounced and came out of the bounce, and then maybe there was some kind of period of ex of accelerated expansion in the beginning. Um, but those are really ideas at the forefront. Um, one of the big questions we have is how do you follow what happens through a bounce, especially if there's a singularity. Uh, and the hope is that somehow quantum gravitational effects change change what happens. Because in general relativity, um, once you have a singularity, you can no longer do any computations. So then, then all bets are off. But uh, yes, the question of uh, so there are <laughs> you know, people are actively thinking about it, um, <laughs> but it's not uh, it's not established yet. Let's say let's put it this way. <laughs> But there's clearly um, clearly something before the hot Big Bang, the hot phase of the Big Bang, which is kind of a tiny fraction of a second after absolute time equals zero. So there's, this, there's some interesting things that can happen in between those. I have a question as well. May I ask my question, please? Yeah, uh, yeah. so th thank, thank you, Professor Pandit and, and uh, uh, Dr. Sakshira. So yes, please um, go ahead, uh, Marty. So I did my research. I did some research before this meeting. It was a pleasure to uh, join this meeting. I have a question for you, Mr. Benjamin. So I did some research on the meeting uh, before joining, and I found out that uh, you have some different interests, a lot of interests of science, statistics, cosmology, astronomy, and and one of them was also artificial intelligence, which is becoming more and more interesting and more and more and people are more and more interested about it. But I'm, I'm more of a science and psychology person. So I wanted to ask you if uh, in one hand we have artificial intelligence and human intelligence in general. And in the other hand, we have intuition. So which one of these is more helpful and is more is helping us to get to the discoveries of the universe or just scientific uh, scientific uh, researches. Thanks for the general. question. Yeah. So why do we have to choose? Let's use everything we have. You know, <laughs> the problems are hard. Let's use intuition. Let's use artificial intelligence. Let's use human intelligence. And one of the big things that I'm doing in my work is I'm trying to figure out how to bring all of these things together and enhance human intelligence with artificial intelligence. Uh, and intuition plays a big role in um, in getting to new insights. So yeah.
I think all of the above. Cooperation. <laughs> Thank right. you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I think Ata Kivank also has a question. Please unmute. Uh, as far as we know, the universe was formed with the Big Bang theory, right? Yes. What will happen if it's formed by chance? Those two are not exclusive of each other. Right? <laughs> you can have a universe okay. coming into existence by chance and the Big Bang happening. Um, so those are those are two different concepts. It's a very because, good question. Right. Sorry, I was going to say Go there's, there's, yes. there's also many theories that uh, uh, postulate, for instance, that you have many, many universes with many different properties. And uh, we just happen to live in the one that has the right properties for um, life to to flourish. So that could be, for instance, an aspect of, of chance. If you have if you have many, uh, the chances that you will exist uh, in the one that has the right the right properties. Okay, thank you. So there's also a question in the chat. So what if the universe is still expanding if it's consuming its remaining energy? I think the question is what drives the expansion. So do you want to take this, or do you want me to? I think it's a good one for you with the example of okay. of the ball, right? It fits very well with the example. Right. I mean, that's exactly what you'd expect, right? If you have, if you, if the ball is the ball is using up its energy as it's fl flying up, and so it's slowing down. In fact, it's turning around and coming back, right? Uh, so I understand exactly this question. This is the crazy thing about the accelerating universe that I can't show you because uh, I would have to create a lot of dark energy here. <laughs> Um, but uh, but you know, it's throwing up throwing up the ball, and then suddenly the ball, as it goes up, it kind of slows down for a while, and it goes. Whoop, it suddenly starts starts zooming away, um, and it's exactly that. It's the fact that as I'm as the you know, the repulsive gravity with this tension is is repulsing the uh, the you know everything. So it's 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 pushing apart. It's refilling by working against um, the tension. And so that's refilling, and so then you have more dark energy, and so dark energy—the amount of dark energy keeps increasing. The density of it stays constant in uh, um, in the extreme case, uh, but the, but you get more and more and more and more, and so the ex expansion keeps accelerating and accelerating and accelerating. You get more and more and more, and so it's sort of self fueling in that sense. And so, um, but energy, you know, you, I mean, the energy kind of works out, work being done against the tension the, t the amount of work is refueling the dark energy because work equals energy equals mass according to einstein and so we're putting mass back in which is filling up the dark energy and so forth so the mass density the energy density keeps constant of the of the and so you just get more and more of it and it's a runaway process that just keeps going crazier and crazier are there any other questions anyone else would like to ask about our two speakers, something? Uh, hi, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Uh, so you mentioned that dark energy is um, like tension. It's, uh, how do you measure dark energy? We don't really measure dark energy directly. We measure the acceleration of the universe. And we find, and so what I've given you is an explanation of... Um, how um, general relativity can produce such an acceleration when you have a lot of tension in it. And we can make um, quite simple models of um, a type type of material, um, this kind of dark tension. Sometimes you know, th this could be called quintessence, or there are all kinds of ex um, detailed ways of, of implementing that, um, with which produce such an acceleration in uh, um in in general relativity so but yes dark energy itself has never actually been measured nobody's gone and gotten a scoop of dark energy and said oh look here it is um it's it's very difficult to measure directly but what we're doing now you've heard about the euclid satellite probably it's just gotten launched a couple of months ago it's operating and so what we're doing is we're charting the effects of dark energy in extreme detail this is the big program that we're doing now uh, over the, in cosmology, um, at, you know, we meaning all cosmologists <laughs> almost, um, um, trying to make these extreme precision measurements to understand exactly how things are accelerating 
uh, and to infer the properties of dark energy that way. But there is still a chance that maybe it's not a form of energy that fills the universe, but uh, but Elsa mentioned a <laughs> an alternative possibility that maybe the whole theory of gravity is wrong. Now, my personal feeling is that gravity has been so, general relativity, Einstein's theory has been so successful uh, that we should probably try and understand first all possibilities of, of the possibilities that it gives us. And so I've given you an example uh, for how to do that. Yeah, that explains it. Thank you so much. I'll be looking forward to the uh, further research as you be doing. Me too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, I just want to, this is a good opportunity to ask any you know, burning questions you may have had. So if not, so maybe this would be a good place to, to end this. I would like to, first of all, thank both of our esteemed speakers here for these really fantastic, these really very nice talks that, they, that they've given us. Also, thank you to you. Uh, I know that these are school hours and it's hard uh, to, to attend this, but it's very nice that, that so many people have really chimed into this. So that's really great. Just as a reminder, um, Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, uh, or X now. Um, you know, we can really engage and continue the conversation over there. So thank you again and have a great rest of the day. And I hope that you consider a career in cosmology or at least astrophysics going forward. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Jackson, also for organizing this. Uh, no, no, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of people, but thank you, both of you. Thank you so much. Thank All you. Right. All right, bye-bye. Great to see bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.